In today's video, we're going to talk about men who have been diagnosed with prostate cancer and upon diagnosis, their PSAs have been over 50. Now, we're going to cover anything from over 50 to over 1,000. Today, Dr. Mark Schultz, who's a 30-year medical oncologist focusing solely in prostate cancer, is going to cover what to do in these situations and what the disease looks like. So today, Dr. Scholz, we're talking about prostate cancer patients who have been newly diagnosed with prostate cancer, but when they were diagnosed, their PSAs were extremely high. I think a lot of times you and I talk about patients that are in the 1 to 50 range and kind of where their PSA is at, but we're talking anywhere from 500 to over 1,000. So I think what the patients really want to know about is stories that of people who have come into remissions and had their cancer just, you know, be controllable even when the PSA is that high upon diagnosis. So can you just share kind of some of the situations that you've encountered with this? What immediately comes to mind is a patient and his prostate cancer came to attention after he was uh, taking out his trash and when he was attacked by a bear in his front yard and seriously mauled. When they took him to the emergency room, you know, he survived the bear attack, thank God. The x-rays showed suspicious sclerotic changes in his bones, and the emergency room doctor was smart enough to get a PSA. His PSA was about 750. He uh, was referred to our practice and managed with a standard uh, approach, which is three-pronged approach of, of uh, first-generation hormone therapy, a second-generation hormone therapy, and a course of taxotere a mild type of chemotherapy. He's done very well. His PSA after six months, his PSA actually peaked at 1,000 before he got started on treatment, uh, but dropped down to less than 0.1 about five months after initiating this protocol of treatment. He continued on uh, the hormone deprivation treatment for 18 months. PSA remained undetectable as we would expect it to. Therapy was discontinued uh, with him in a complete remission. So he continues to be monitored, his testosterone is uh, recovering, and his status remains in complete remission. So this is not uh, a one-off or something that would be terribly surprising because modern prostate cancer treatment is very effective. And someone who presents with this sort of very advanced prostate situation, he had spots throughout his bones uh, at the time of diagnosis, is not going to be determined as much by the stage of the disease is going to be determined by the responsiveness of the biology of their specific type of cancer to the treatments that we have available. And fortunately, the majority of men that even with newly diagnosed advanced disease have very responsive disease and modern medicine has gotten wise enough to use all our available tools up front rather than waiting for something to stop working and then trying another. The, the approach of giving all three medicines, first, second generation hormone therapy and taxotere at the initiation has led to uh, people going into complete remissions and doing extremely well. Before I get to my next question, please click that subscribe button. When you do this, it tells YouTube that this video is helpful for you, and they will push our videos out to other prostate cancer patients who need help. Also, if you would like to donate to our cause, you can do so at pcri.org forward slash donate. Now back to my conversation with Dr. Schulz. Talking about PSA just as a general test, I think a lot of people go, well, PSA is not really useful because it's not really saying that, you know, where the prostate cancer is or what type of prostate cancer you have. But we talk about it in the context where PSA is like a check engine light that something is wrong and you need to either, you know, check out what this issue is. So when people have PSAs that are that high, does that necessarily mean that they have more aggressive disease? It means they have more advanced disease. The aggressiveness of the cancer is probably best defined by the biology and how well it, it responds to the available treatments we have. A number of other types of cancer don't have the riches that we have in the prostate cancer realm. Hormone therapies are modestly effective in breast cancer. The hormone treatment that we have in prostate cancer is about five times more effective than what uh, women with breast cancer can benefit from with hormone therapy uh, to treat breast, uh, breast cancer. So we have a, a a very fortunate situation in the prostate world. It's true that there are some individuals that aren't going to do as well as this example that I cited, but the outcomes are going to be determined within the first six months of starting treatment, depending on whether the PSA can be lowered down to undetectable levels, that is less than 0.1. So now that he is off treatment, 
and his testosterone is coming back. What does the monitoring process look like and what are we expecting in his future? So he's in what we call a complete remission and that's going to be tested because uh, we know that this individual has hormone sensitive disease and if the disease starts to come back, uh, we can always put him back on testosterone deprivation with the expectation that his PSA will go back to undetectable levels. But in 2024, we have other tools that can be used as an alternative and perhaps give him a better quality of life. If the lion's share of the cancer has been eradicated by the methods that we've already accomplished, but maybe one or two spots are stubborn and start to show up as he gets his testosterone back, we have the option of getting a PET scan, finding the location of these spots, and using spot radiation to sterilize them. The effectiveness of that will be immediately apparent because if you get radiation without hormone treatment, the PSA should start declining and uh, go back to undetectable levels if all the active disease is radiated. The idea of getting someone into a complete remission, stopping treatment, monitoring progress after testosterone recovers, and then using modern scanning techniques and spot radiation as a backup plan is going to extend these remissions and possibly in certain individuals that didn't get cured up front, which in the past we never even talked about cure for someone with widespread metastatic disease, will now uh, have an option of controlling the disease long-term with these secondary or even um, tertiary methods. We have uh, lutetium-177 now. So if, if spots were to show up in more than four or five locations, which would not be amenable to spot radiation, injectable radiation, lutetium-177, so-called pluvicto, would be another option to try and control the disease apart from uh, simply going back on hormone treatment, which is effective, but is associated with side effects. So if a patient comes in with a PSA that is over a thousand, is it automatic that they need to do triple therapy because those metastatic lesions are absolutely present? Uh, I would say in most cases, the exception might be in someone that's, you know, 90 years old and they had a fantastic response to first and second generation hormone therapy. Would you withhold uh, taxotere chemotherapy in some of those people, perhaps. This individual that we're talking about, the one that got mauled by the bear, he was 79 years old, and but very fit, and was able to tolerate the protocol quite nicely, and has done quite well as a result. Besides this patient, are there other patients in your practice that have walked into your office with PSAs that are extremely high like this that you've seen you know, go into remission, or is he more of a niche case? When I see a patient like this, and yes, we do see patients who are not screening on PSA, and they go to the emergency room with bone pain. This is the way prostate cancer always presented before we had PSA back in the 1970s, for example. As a professional, having seen a lot of cases like this, my expectation is that we're going to get probably at least half of the patient's PSA levels down to undetected. They'll go into a complete remission with hormone treatment, with or without chemotherapy on top of the hormone treatment. So it's not a universal expectation that we'll be able to get people into remission with this initial foray into treatment, but uh, I would say at least half of the patients can expect to get into a complete remission. So for the 50% of patients that do not necessarily go into remission, what are their options? This is a much more serious development, and these are the cases that are going to give prostate cancer a bad name in, in certain individuals. There's a big difference between people that get a complete remission and those that after, say, six months of androgen deprivation with or without chemotherapy can't get their PSA below 0.1. When men are not getting into a complete remission. It's got to be a uh, full court press to try and figure out a way to get them into remission. Uh, repeat PET scans to see if there's one or two stubborn hormone resistant spots that perhaps could be radiated. Early use of Plavicto uh, to uh, try and get disease control. I had a patient face this very situation and PSA came from, I think he was up to about, he started off in the mid 200s and after chemotherapy and, and first and second generation hormone treatment, his PSA only dropped down to about five or six. Sounds like a big change, but that means that there's unequivocal hormone resistant disease that's pushing back. When he had his uh, PSMA PET scan, there were too many spots to go uh, zapping and it looked pretty worrisome. However, he was able to get uh, insurance approval for uh, lutetium-177 Plavicto. Uh, and fortunately, he had a remarkable response to that. His PSA has dropped down to undetectable levels now. He was slated to get 
uh, six injections, but his PSA dropped to undetectable levels after the first, I think it was the first four infusions. And so we decided to save the last two infusions since he was already in a remission and stopped after four infusions. He's gone off of uh, testosterone deprivation. PSMA PET scan sh uh, shows no residual disease. So I think that those men that can't get their PSAs down to undetectable levels with the, the triple approach that we've talked about uh, need to redouble their efforts with whatever available tools uh, can be implemented to push hard to get into a complete remission. Uh, the absence of a complete remission is a very dangerous situation. It's not something where you just live with it. If the existing therapy is not getting you to where you want to go, you have to change your methods and find something that will work. You know, a lot of times we talk about the timing of prostate cancer and, and prostate cancer being slow growing, but when somebody gets a PSA test with this type of number, you know, does that mean they need to act more quickly into getting, you know, the right imaging and to getting the right doctors? Yes, I, I know a lot of times the message that we've shared in the past is go slow, take your time, be selective, make sure you're getting the right treatment before embarking down a, a pathway that may be irreversible. But when people have a metastatic disease that's uncontrolled, this is more akin to the other cancers that we think of, the more dangerous ones, the lung cancers, pancreas cancers. And in those situations, and in this situation with prostate cancer patients, it's not something where you wanna wait around and give the disease time to pick up momentum. The failure to get to a complete remission, even if the PSA is just sort of going sideways, you know, may have dropped from 200 down to five or 10 or something or two, and just seems to be staying there and people are reassured and comforted by the fact that it's dropped so much. But what we need to be very concerned about is that there's active uncontrolled cancer that is persisting. The timeliness of getting switched over to a new treatment is important. This is a small area of prostate cancer but a very important one where uh, people don't want to postpone or think about it. They want to find a treatment. In fact, what I tell patients when they're in this situation, not only should they sort out what the next treatment is, it's good to have a backup treatment for that because we don't know if these backup treatments are gonna be effective. So it should not only be a plan B, but a plan C. What about in situations, let's just say you have a patient where they, the hormone therapy is no longer working, they've already had the Taxotere, they've now gone on Pluvicto and the Pluvicto hasn't controlled the disease. What are the next options? Genetic testing to see if they have a BRCA mutation. Uh, the PARP inhibitors are effective backup, another type of chemotherapy. Genetic testing to see if they have uh, multiple mutations uh, detected. Uh, genetic testing with things like Garden 360 or Foundation 1. Men that have a lot of mutations uh, detected in their cancer cells are more likely to respond to immune therapy like Keytruda, Optivo, Yervoy. And of course, it uh, can't be overlooked, we've already mentioned it, but it's not considered standard fare. When you have PET scans that show only two or three metastatic spots, even though those may be hormone resistant spots, they're not gonna be radiation resistant spots. So you can sterilize metastatic lesions with spot radiation if there aren't too many of them. There's another you know, injectable radiation called Zofigo, which works on bone do you use that alongside other treatments that you know will effectively take away these spots if there's more than five? Yeah, I think Zofigo was uh, originally FDA approved showing that it extends life in men with very advanced disease. The studies that were done in Europe, patients had you know PSAs in the hundreds and compared to a placebo, Zofigo extended life. The limitations of Zofigo, uh, they didn't see a clear-cut PSA decline, and it doesn't have any effectiveness against liver or lymph node metastasis. But often there are patients who have sp many spots on the bones and the lion's share of the disease is in the bones. Zofigo, I think, is a very good option for, uh, for individuals that are, have that pattern of disease. So we have Provenge, which has been approved for prostate cancer, and it has you know, anti-cancer effects as an immune therapy. Does it fit into these you know, different scenarios? Provenge, being an immune therapy, is much more likely to be beneficial in people that have small amounts of disease. So the window for using it, in my judgment would be in that man who has uh, had his PSA drop from two or 300, maybe down to 0.7, and then it's 0 0.8 and 0 0.9. We can see early hormone resistance, but the, the disease isn't rampaging and uh, there, aren't, there isn't too much metastatic disease. That's where I think Provenge is gonna do the greatest good. And it's, it's pretty easy to slip it in there because it only takes six weeks to give, uh, and it uh, typically has no side effects at all. 
I would give Provenge at even earlier stages if it wasn't so expensive and if insurance would cover it. Those millionaires out there who uh, can purchase it uh, out, of their, out of their penny accounts, they, um, they might want to consider Provenge at an earlier stage. For the rest of us who have to uh, rely on insurance coverage, it's optimal in men that are hormone resistant, have a proven metastasis, which we're talking about with these patients, and have a rising PSA and uh, insurance will cover Provenge in that situation. In the men that have high PSAs that are out of control and, um, and we're trying to control the, the active disease, Provenge is not a good option. Provenge is f something to administer almost like a vaccine when things are going relatively well. And as such, it, there's a fairly narrow window where, where it can be applied. And I think for that reason, oftentimes it gets overlooked. So you mentioned PARP inhibitors. How effective are those? PARP inhibitors are very effective in men that have certain mutations. And this is why genetic testing is so critically important in these patients. Uh, BRCA1 and 2, ATM uh, mutations, and a few others. If men have the type of cancer that manifests those specific mutations, the response rates are over 50%. And the medicines are well tolerated. This is a mild form of oral chemotherapy, so it's not devoid of side effects, but it's a, it's a mild type of uh, chemotherapy. And uh, I have one patient who's been on a PARP inhibitor now for three years. His, his uh, situation looked very bleak. And after starting treatment, his PSA has gone down to undetectable levels, and he's been maintained in a complete remission just with PARP inhibition uh, for the last three years. If you are someone who's been diagnosed with prostate cancer, and upon diagnosis, you have one of these higher PSA ranges, and then you have metastatic disease, it's important to make sure that you feel comfortable with your medical team. And if you're not comfortable to seek second and third opinions, you wanna to talk to medical oncologists and people who are going to answer your questions and not only create the current plan, but the backup plan in case the current, you know, treatment that you're on is not working and you want to create the future plans. This not only helps with emotional health and mental health, but it also helps to get to the next treatment faster should the current treatment not work. Once those plans are in place, you know, it gives you a good framework of what to do. Another thing that's very helpful is to get friends and family involved and get the support you need. You know, maybe it's time to join a support group and talk to other men who are dealing with advanced disease and talk to them about what the options are and what they did. Who were their doctors? What are the reviews? What, what helped and what didn't help. That's a great resource. So we're going to go ahead and link those support groups in the description below this video. Another great resource is a talk that Dr. Eugen Kwan from Mayo Clinic did from a previous conference. He covers advanced disease and goes in depth with what Dr. Scholl said and the treatments available and what works and how it works. It's a couple hours long, but it's very helpful and it'll help you have, you know, good conversations with your doctor. You can go ahead and take your questions, ask your doctor and say, what do you think about this treatment? I heard this doctor from Mayo Clinic mention this and and it's helped a lot of patients. So we're going to go ahead and link that in the description below this video as well. If you need help with your personal case, please contact our helpline. These are advanced prostate cancer patients who are now in remission, and they can give you a lot of information that helps you, you know, really cultivate the conversation with your doctor so that you walk in with a game plan and you make sure that you get the information you need from those appointments. We want to make sure that we're taking care of your questions because those questions matter and how comfortable you are matters. And helpline's a really great resource for that. So you can contact us at pcri.org forward slash helpline. Now, if you would like more information about prostate cancer, go ahead and leave it um, or, you know, go ahead and visit our website at PCRI.org. And if you would like to leave topics or questions or things you want us to cover, go ahead and leave it in the comment section below this video. We really appreciate you watching this video and we hope you have a great day.